원래 이 부처님의 가르침으로 Mr. Morris, Mr. t u z u n the past is another country. Now, you and I, we've just walked through the streets of Hongdae, of Mangwon together, and we both inhabit this wonderful city of Seoul, and we frequent the same events and occasions, and we see each other. But you've done something in this city which I haven't done, in that you first came here in 1972. Yes. Nine, nine years before I even entered, entered this world. Entered this world. Yeah. Can I take you back to 1972? The accommodation, the smells, the, what was Korea like then? Because can you bring it to life for me? I'll do my best. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we came over as a group of Peace Corps volunteers, and my particular group had the designation K-26, So there were, in fact, 25 groups who mm. um, were either serving still in Korea or arriving in, in Korea uh, at the same time we did. In mm. fact, that immediately before our group, uh, the K-25 group had arrived a couple of days earlier. So we arrived in late um, November of 72. And we were um, about 30 of us. Um, And we were on a 747 airliner of the, really, I think the first series, the initial iteration. It had come out, I think, in about 69 or 70 for mm -hmm. commercial service. And so here in 72, there weren't that many 747s flying around the world in those days. Right. And we had rendezvoused um, from our homes across America in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And then we'd boarded this um, uh, Northwest Airlines flight, which I guess would be Delta Airlines today, um, in Seattle and had flown across to Tokyo because the early uh, editions of the 747 didn't have the range to fly all the way from Seattle to Seoul. Mm -hmm. So we overnighted in, um, oh, wow. in Japan, in Tokyo. Um, So that was a minor adventure. And then the next morning, we boarded the uh, plane and did the two-hour flight from Tokyo to Seoul. And as we approached uh, Korean airspace uh, and the plane began to descend, uh, we became a bit uh, concerned mm. because we were unable to see anything on the ground that looked green. <laughs> the, uh, It was November. Yes, yes, it was November, and of course the the trees uh, that were there had um, shed their leaves. But nevertheless, it did not appear that there were very many trees mm. <clears throat> over some of the mountains that we were uh, flying over, and that <clears throat> that seemed odd to us. Um, and then as we uh, flew into Kimpo Airport itself, uh, there was a, a further uh, feeling of apprehension because as we looked around the perimeter of the airfield, we mm. saw the flak guns. The anti-aircraft guns were mm. in position um, uh, along the tarmac in various, various positions in case, of course, the North Koreans would uh, try a surprise attack. Are they uh, big? Flat I don't think I've well, ever seen uh, one. The, um, I think standard flat guns that they had at that time were about uh, four, the 40 millimeter Bofors, um, which uh, I, I guess are about uh, two and a half, three inches uh, in diameter, mm. uh, and uh, had been in use in World War II. So they weren't exactly... Um, the latest in, in mm. kit, but they worked, I'm sure. And uh, the fact that they were on what we thought was a civilian uh, airport, and, and we were instructed when we landed that we should keep the uh, curtains closed over the windows. So um, we weren't supposed to take pictures uh, because it was a secure uh, zone. Okay. The, the airport was a strategic um, asset for the nation. and. Uh, the possibility of photographs uh, uh, being um, 
taken and somehow finding their way into uh, North Korean or Soviet hands. Mm -hmm. Remember, the in 1972, the Cold War was at its height. Uh, the Vietnam War was a hot war that was going on. Mm -hmm. And the Soviets and the Chinese were both supplying um, weapons to uh, the North Vietnamese, while the U.S., of course, had taken a massive effort to back the South Vietnamese with Korean support. Yeah. So the Koreans had like 50,000 troops in Vietnam in 72. Mm. How um, old were you when you were flying in? I was 23. Country? Were you scared? Well, as I say, it was somewhat uh, apprehensive uh, to, uh, you know, you, we thought we were flying into a, a commercial civilian airport. Mm. And normally you, you don't see um, anti-aircraft weapons at civilian airports. <laughs> I don't think I've ever it's, seen them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not a standard feature, I believe. <laughs> so we were a little bit disconcerted about the, the look of the land, the fact that there did not seem to be very many trees at all. Uh, and then we, we saw these military uh, uh, facilities at uh, what we thought had had to be a civilian airport, but it didn't seem that entirely civilian. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we were uh, greeted by the Peace Corps staff from the U.S. Embassy mm. and um, some Korean uh, admin colleagues who were uh, Peace Corps employees and staff. Uh, and they um, guided us through the immigration procedures at um, at Kimpo, and they had uh, a used American Greyhound bus drawn up on the tarmac to take us from Kimpo mm. down to Tegu. Oh, wow! On the new four-lane um, Seoul Busan Expressway. And as we rolled down the highway, it became clear that um, there were uh, very, very few cars. Mm. So in 1972, uh, I believe Hyundai Motors uh, was only five years old and had hardly begun to produce any cars at all. Mm. Um, they had a technical agreement with uh, Mitsubishi Motors, mm -hmm. and they did begin... Um, to import Mitsubishi um, uh, engines uh, and components to assemble into what was called the Pony One. But uh, a lot of the initial models of the Pony were, um, were basically Mitsubishi cars that were simply assembled in Korea. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we, we noticed that there was virtually no traffic whatsoever on the Seoul Busan Expressway except for some buses. Um, and there were lots of times when a, you, you just didn't see any other uh, vehicles on the roadway at all. Mm. Um, was the countryside still sparse as you rolled down to... Not only was the countryside sparse, mm. uh, we did see some farmers out in the, uh, in the, uh, the non, non pot yep. um, churning up the ground with uh, ox teams. And we thought, well... Ox teams, yeah. not n not anything uh, like a tractor with an engine, uh, but an ox team. Not so a John Deere tractor. Yeah, I, I can remember one of my Peace Corps uh, pals saying, um, "Gosh, maybe we're going back two thousand years in time." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it it did seem um, rather basic, yeah. to put it that way, and it was pretty clear that. As we rolled down the Seoul Prasan Expressway, we got a good view of the uh, the paddy fields on either side of the uh, bus uh, as we headed south to Tegu, and it, it was obvious that there there just weren't any uh, motorized uh, farming uh, machinery. Uh, they were all using mm -hmm. um, oxen to. Uh, churn up the ground wow. at that point um, because, of course, the harvest had already happened, so they just wanted to break up the ground, I yeah. suppose. Um, so that, that caused a little um, head-scratching to go on. Uh, wondered about that. 
And then we did roll into Tegu uh, about dusk, and it was quite cold, mm. and we were taken to a, uh, I'll call it, uh, to be generous, a three-star hotel, but <laughs> probably, to be fair, more like a two-star. Yeah. And it was called the New Grand Hotel, and it was neither new nor was it grand. <laughs> but it was in Tegu. Uh, but it was, in fact, in, in Tegu, <laughs> and it was very near the Talsung um, uh, Park area. Mm. Uh, and we came to enjoy the park uh, in our spare time. Uh, but the first thing that, um, that happened was that we were um, introduced to the... Um, American staff who would supervise our training program, and we were a university education program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our assignments were going to be uh, as instructors of English at various Korean universities around the country, mm -hmm. and um, the accent was to be on uh, teaching spoken English, so we were going to... Um, be trained in the latest uh, uh, TESOL, um, the teaching of English to speakers of other languages mm -hmm. uh, methodologies. Mm. And we were also going to spend um, seven or eight hours per day uh, in Korean classes. And we had about uh, a half a dozen Korean language uh, teachers, most of whom were from Seoul, and I think most of whom had been teaching Korean either at the Roman Catholic uh, Myungdo One Institute, which mm -hmm. I think stopped operating in the late 1970s, perhaps, or the Yonsei University Ohakdong, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. uh, uh, linguistic school there. Um, and so uh, the next morning, <clears throat> well, that evening, we were given um, sandwiches. So. We, we weren't initially exposed to Korean food. I mm. think that happened the next morning, perhaps, or at lunch the next... Uh, no, the next morning, I, I'm sure that we had uh, eggs and toast for breakfast. But mm -hmm. then at, at lunch or at dinner that, um, that next day, our first full day in, in the country, mm. we were exposed to Korean food. And I thought it was pretty ghastly. <laughs> I mean, I had never seen anything like kimchi. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think peanut butter is pretty costly, but I'll go with you. Well, this. I mean, the peanut butter, <laughs> if you happen to like peanuts, the aroma is, is not unpleasant. But yeah. in my family, we were of Americans of British and uh, Irish heritage, and um, we didn't use uh, garlic in, in cooking. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I was a um, meat and potato and uh, green veg uh, kind of guy. I thought that was good eating. Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't too uh, adventurous. Adventure might be uh, some Italian um, food or uh, possibly uh, trying a little Chinese. Mm -hmm. But that was, of course, heavily modified for American taste. So I was unaware of any Korean restaurant in the U.S., uh, before I came to Korea. Um, I had been notified by the Peace Corps that they'd accepted me and they were going to assign me in to Korea for the university teaching program. Uh, so there was several months uh, between the summer of 72 and November when we actually mm. flew over to Korea. And I did try to read uh, about Korea and discovered that our local University library, Towson University, uh, had some Korean books um, uh, that went back to the 19th century, like Homer Holbert's oh, book. Oh, wow. But the uh, local public library had mainly uh, books that were related to the Korean War. Mm hmm And, of course, to Syngman Rhee. Mm hmm um, and because at that stage, of course, the Korean in 1972, the Korean War had uh, ended just 19 years uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So um, it, it was still rather fresh in people's memory. What were those books like when they were? So you go to the library. We'll come back to the food. But you go to the library to read books about Korea. Did it 
did they bring career alive to you before you came? Did they give you some idea of what you were coming into? Were the, because I sometimes find when I go back and read old books about Korea, they they refer to the E dynasty and things yes, like well, this. Of course, that, that's it was what, all written differently. Yeah, back I then. mean, Homer Holbert was uh, here in the late nineteenth century, yeah. and his his book was was all about the um, the history of. Uh, uh, the dynastic history of of Korea and mm. the customs of of the um, uh, Chosun dynasty towards the end of the the dynasty in, mm. in the late nineteenth century when he was uh, when he was here, mm. um, and uh, I noticed that in some cases Korea was spelt with a C rather than a K. <laughs> I noticed that you pronounce it Kimpo and Tegu rather the, the the pronunciation here is also changed, isn't it? Yeah. Even yeah. the way you say Hanja, yeah. you seem to have a a, a, a chiat sound on there. Yeah. Well, um, the um, uh, the um, orthography of putting things into English, mm. uh, uh, I, I think, is the system in current <coughs> use is, I think, not terribly um, accurate um, mm. uh, in rendering, um, in, in looking at the English letters and then trying to uh, say the word and have it sound anything uh, like the, the, the Korean original. Mm. Mm. Um, so you, you get people saying Busan <laughs> rather than Pusan. Um, <laughs> and uh, Gyeong Sang Do rather than Gyeong Sang Do. So I would, I would, I prefer the old, I guess, McCune Hour where the, uh, yeah, the, the, where the Gyeong Sang Do would be uh, spelt with a K rather than a G. Mm. Um, and in, in fact, um, under the current system, the surname uh, Kim should really be spelt with a G. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I just don't see that as being terribly useful. Um, and you said you were but, doing like eight hours of Korean. Yeah, we studied Korean time. intensively in small uh, classes. As I say, we had about a half dozen Korean instructors, and we were divided into classes of about five or six each. That's nice, small. Uh, so they were nice small uh, classes, and we could make. Um, Reasonable progress. I'd say that, um, um, you know, l learning to read uh, the Hangul is, is very, it's only 24 letters, so yeah. that's straightforward. Didn't take very long at all. Uh, but then um, the problem in Korean, of course, is for English speaking people with the verb ending um, every, every sentence, it's very awkward for us to get that. Uh, in, into our heads mm. um, because, uh, you know, I to the store go just doesn't sound right to us. Nope. Uh, and yet uh, that's the system. So oh, to the store go, it would be. It'd even leave out the I, I think. Yeah, it, well, Korean? that's that, that's it. You can yeah. you can just dispense with, with <laughs> the uh, with the initial subject. It's understood. Yeah. Uh, so often. Um, <clears throat> so it can be said or unsaid. But anyhow, um, it's um, it was quite awkward, and I think what we wound up doing was we would memorize dialogues mm. uh, because that seemed to be the basic uh, instructional method for both the Myungdo Won Institute uh, books and the Yonsei uh, Ohakdong uh, books was uh, an emphasis on um, brief uh, bits of dialogue. Mm. Um, in, in particular settings, like uh, using the post office, like buying a stamp, yeah. <laughs> like going to the barber shop, yeah. and and asking for your hair to be cut short, short uh, back and sides, please. There you are. <laughs> um, or uh, buying a train ticket uh, and um, uh, taking a taxi uh, and. Um, did you pick uh, it up quickly? Your Korean is, well, is, no, is, is the, excellent. Was well, it something I mean, that came after, naturally to you? Well, um, was it hard graft? Uh, I'd say it was hard hard graft. Mm -hmm. I, I think what we 
what we learned was very useful in that initial three-month training mm. because it was intensive. Mm. So we were confident that we were able to say uh, things. But you see, the, um, the problem then is the listening comprehension because sometimes if, uh, if you ask a person um, you know, what time the next train is, they may uh, say something that that you're not expecting. Mm-hmm. They they use mm-hmm. a phrase that wasn't part of your dialogue phrase, yeah. and you're you're all at sea then. So, mm. so it took us, uh, I think, a, a while. And quite frankly, some of the uh, Peace Corps volunteer colleagues um, never really picked up a great deal of Korean. I'd say after their initial. Three month, and we had uh, periodic uh, refresher stints where we would do uh, during the um, school uh, holidays mm-hmm. uh, refresher uh, stints in in Korean of uh, three, four, five weeks uh, at a time, uh, which were very useful. And um, but the thing is that some of the volunteers wound up teaching in Seoul. And in Seoul, even in the early 1970s, you got a a lot of people at universities who could uh, speak to you in English. Mm -hmm. And um, the students were, in many cases, like the the cream of of the Korean university student body. Mm -hmm. Um, So those volunteers who were in Seoul tended not to have uh, much occasion to have to rely on Korean, so their Korean tended not to be terribly um, terribly good. But then those of us who went to the countryside, and I was assigned to teach at Kyungnam College, in, which is now Kyungnam University, mm. in Masaan. And the college had, in those days, about 2,000 students overall, or maybe 2,500. Mm. And of that number, uh, that's in all departments. The English department was about 120 students in the four years. Oh, wow. So, I mean, the first year might be uh, 40 students. But then uh, what happened was the men began to drop out from their second or third year to do their military service obligation. They still do that today, like the second <laughs> yeah. or third year of university. Yeah, it's quite common. Not before it's nor a, it's after. A stand. Well, it's just From the way back they, then too. Yeah, they like to get started at university. And then they, they go off and do the military, and then they return and finish the university. So. Uh, uh, I, I'm curious what the, the classroom atmosphere would have been like? Was it full of people like asleep on the desk? Were they very respectful? What was it like walking into well, a classroom? They were, they were very polite. Um, mm. it, was a very cons- it was a more conservative society overall in those days, um, by far. Um, how, could you explain how well, did that manifest um, or what was it? It um, manifested itself in the way they, they dressed. Uh, they didn't have jeans. Um, what did they wear? Stupid question. But. Well, they, they wore uh, wool or cotton trousers mm. and, uh, and, a, and a jacket. Mm. Um, if they had a suit, they wear a suit. But you would see them in the same clothes on uh, the Friday that they had been wearing since Monday because mm. they usually didn't have uh, a change of, of clothing in many cases. Mm. So they had to wear what they had day after day. Um, but yeah, they. When you got to a place like Masan in the early seventies, you you found that there weren't any English speakers to speak of, it, including in the in the college administration. Mm. So the the people who spoke English were the four English professors, <laughs> uh, and then a few of the students in the English department who actually took some interest in it. But mm. a lot of them were were actually. Um, not interested in studying English. They had been assigned to uh, f- to uh, study English by their parents who mm. thought that would be a good thing. And they were probably going to become middle school or high school English teachers. But they, they weren't devoted to the, to the subject. And an awful lot of them, I noticed from the very first days, would come up and, and chatter to me in Korean. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They they were English department students, but 
their um, their desire to speak English wasn't really that that great. And were they um, were they comfortable coming up to you? I mean, I, I don't imagine there were many foreigners in there at well, the time. Yeah, I mean, so. they 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 were, um, I think, quite comfortable. I mean, the girls were shyer. Um, mm. Uh, and the guys were were more relaxed, uh, and there was a certain formality because in those days, I think the the role of the teacher was more idealized, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, so the, the the Koreans tended to look up to to teachers. It was considered a very respectful, um, respectable mm -hmm. uh, profession. Uh, at any level, from uh, whether you were a, a primary school teacher, middle school, high school, or a university professor. And of course, the university professors regarded themselves sort of the top of the heap when it came mm -hmm. to, uh, to prestige. Um, but the students were uh, you know, eager to uh, approach. They were not used to being around foreigners. Um, the Peace Corps volunteers who had preceded me at the college were virtually the only foreigners that they came across, mm -hmm. uh, unless they happened to come across a uh, a Japanese manager at one of the factories uh, in the Masan area, mm -hmm. uh, because Masan had the free export zone, and of the I don't know twenty two or 23 factories that were established within the zone, I think about 19 of them were Japanese companies. Wow. Yeah, and then they hired uh, the Korean workers yeah. to do the, the, the factory work. But in some cases, the Japanese sent over um, management um, to, um, you know, to, to work uh, at the factories. and. Can I just go back to the students a little yeah. bit? Because today there's this huge focus on education. And people go to hagwons and study until night. And there is that education. Education will set you free. I don't mean that. But that would be the key to social mobility. And was yes. there, did you come here and go, wow, these people study hard? Or was it yeah. not quite well, like no, that? I mean, we did, um, we, we did find that these students um, were, uh, you know, Hard workers at uh, at the game of uh, studying, mm. and I say game because it it was uh, it, it was geared as then as it still is today towards passing a test, mm. and the test wasn't going to have anything to do with whether they could speak English or not. The test was going to uh, determine um, what level. Of mastery they had of vocabulary, mm -hmm. um, and whether they could comprehend written English. So that was really what was important for a middle school or a high school student to be mm -hmm. working on. They weren't. The Peace Corps actually did initially have a high school uh, spoken English instructional program, mm -hmm. but that was ditched quite early on because it was discovered that when students reached high school. Mm -hmm. They had to focus exclusively on prep for the university entrance exams, and um, the time uh, to learn spoken English was considered a, a waste of time in that re in that context. Mm. But the middle school students were, it was decided, were further away from having to sit for the university entrance exam. Mm. And so it uh, made sense, it was thought, um, to, to have Peace Corps uh, people teaching the first and second year students. I, I don't remember that we did uh, third year or not. I'm, I, I wasn't involved in – I had friends who were uh, Peace Corps volunteers teaching in the middle schools, and mm -hmm. they were always assigned a co-teacher who could act as an interpreter if there was a hang up on what the uh, spoken in words that the Korean students in middle school and their first or second year of middle school perhaps weren't picking up on. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then the um, Peace Corps volunteer might ask the Korean co-teacher to do some explanation in yeah. Korean and that sort of thing. But um, 
Yeah, in uh, in in what we were doing at um, Kyungnam College uh, for the English department students was that I was teaching them uh, English composition, mm -hmm. um, and uh, immediately discovered that there were great, uh, you know, cultural constraints on formulating. Uh, composition in English uh, because it's perfectly okay in in Korean to you know be discussing uh, let's say the quality of the coffee that you're you're drinking mm -hmm. and then suddenly go off on a tangent about the weather but when we write in English um, if we're writing about the quality of the coffee, we would focus on that, and we wouldn't uh, go into any mention of of the weather. Uh, but what, what's the know. expression? Namun <laughs> soda. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, that's it. You know, yeah. it comes from one side and it goes to the other. Um, so um, it was difficult to get them to to focus their thoughts and to. Put their thoughts in 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 English writing that was decipherable, mm. uh, because of course writing English for them was a very awkward thing because th they weren't used to to having uh, a verb in the middle of a sentence. Um, for them in in Korean, of course, the verb's always at the end point. And this is a stupid question, but were they still writing? They were writing horizontally in Korean yeah. at that time in the seventies. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm sure there will be some people very angry that we got to your first meal when you arrived in Daegu and then we went off on all of our. We started on the well, coffee and went off to the weather. We did that, but so you're based in you're in Masan now. You're you're in, doing this. Yeah. Now you're reading the food and drink. Well, yes, I, I overcame my aversion to Korean uh, to a small extent in uh, my training, my three-month training program. Mm. And I discovered things like uh, the occasional um, pulgogi experience mm. was really quite, quite nice. Uh, but beef was almost never on the menu. Uh, because of the expense, so um, was it that hard to get at the time? I mean, was it was food... no, it was available, but it was very expensive. Okay, so the Peace Corps normally didn't provide the, mm. that sort of thing to us. What we discovered was the Chinese restaurants uh, were run all over the country by Chinese people, mm -hmm. and uh, that the food they produced was not very similar to what we thought of as Chinese food in America mm. that it, it was it was modified considerably but it was actually quite good was it still jajangmyeon and dan, well it dan was dan it was jajangmyeon and it was uh, it was pogum pop yeah but you could get a seo pogum pop the uh, the, the shrimp uh, fried rice mm. And they'd put a fried egg on top of it, and so you get this big dish of uh, of uh, fresh fried rice with mm. a lot of shrimp in it, mm. and a fried egg on top, and that that would suit you uh, very well for either a lunch or a dinner. And it was a the princely sum of two hundred won, which at that time was equivalent of fifty U.S. cents. Would two hundred won would that would they be notes? Would they be coins? Um, there were 101 uh, notes. Okay. Um, uh, but they were being replaced with coins. Mm -hmm. um, so the basic uh, <clears throat> note was the 500 um, won. Okay. Uh, but you could still run into 101 uh, notes. But uh, generally, five hundred uh, won. So it's two hundred won for your for your sale bokkeumbap at the Chinese restaurant. Yeah, and a beer. If you um, were going to splurge for a beer, uh, that that would be four hundred won as well. Oh, double the price of the food. Yes, the beer. Yes, yeah. so, so beer was very expensive, and as Peace Corps volunteers, we could not afford to drink it because our allowance was five hundred won per day. Oh wow! So we had a. Um, now, some of us brought some money. Uh, I didn't, but some of my friends uh, brought some money in, I believe. You know, a few dollars here and there, a couple hundred maybe, mm. uh, whatever. And they could change some money into Korean uh, money and uh, have a little bit more spending money that way. 
Um, was there soju or makali floating oh, about? Oh, there was a lot of soju. No. Uh, but most of us didn't like the taste. Mm. Um, it seemed disagreeable. It was also more potent in those days. The typical soju nowadays seems to be uh, about 18, 19 percent alcohol. In those days, it was 25. Mm. So a bit more potent. And um, being young people, I guess we had a, a desire for the sweeter tastes and uh, so I remember a lot of Peace Corps parties where we take orange soda mm. um, or Coca Cola and uh, put a bottle of that and then mix in a bottle of the soju. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd get a very sweet but um, a, but fairly potent. Um, alcoholic beverage that way. They used to call them kettles when I arrived in 2005. There would be these big two-liter the uh, soda, soda bottles and then uh, about the head the next day. But what we normally drank, um, because it was so affordable, was the makali. And the makali... in the still same cups, the metal cups, did you drink Yeah, they used in the little um, brass uh, cups. Yeah, sorry, brass, yeah. And, the, and brass uh, pots, the mm. chujinja. And... Um, the that pot of Moncoli would set you back um, fifty or a hundred won. Um, was the Anju like? Was it was squid. Anju, uh, in, in a place like Masan, yeah. um, the Anju would be dried fish, okay. uh, gunpo, um, and uh, it was dried pollock. In fact, um, young te. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So it, it wasn't bad at all, um, and you could sometimes get some some fresh seafood in Masan because there was a fishing fleet there, mm. and they would bring in, uh, I, you know, fresh fish, and and um, a lot of us got exposed to uh, sashimi that way, or sengsun way, as they they would say. Um, Was there much nightlife? <laughs> Were well, they, were they discos uh, up or to – uh, no, 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 that no. was considered um, too risque. It was okay. a very conservative sort of society uh, in that sense. There mm. were a lot of places to uh, to drink um, with or without female companionship. Mm -hmm. uh, but, of course, those who wanted the uh, companionship of uh, the fair sex had um, – you had to have some um, uh, some wherewithal to um, pay the hostess fee and the uh, the, the uh, beer, uh, which was the typical drink in the uh, establishments that had um, uh, hostesses. Mm. Um, our uh, English department professors liked to go to a hostess establishment every so often. Uh, but they drank beer rather than whiskey. Mm -hmm. The only time they drank whiskey would be if someone uh, had a friend who had managed to go overseas and come back with a bottle of whiskey that was gifted to one of the professors, and then he would share that um, w when we got together. Mm. But but typically, um, we, we didn't go to the hostess uh, uh Bar. We we went to um, the same places that the uh, college students went to, the university students went to, um, you know, ordinary makali houses, mm. um, and uh, the Anju was very cheap. Um, uh, and you could get anything from ramen um, with an egg in it to the dried fish and. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it was cheap and cheerful. It, that's what it sounds like with the the lack of trees, the ox, and the the, the bulgogi hard to come by. The when the beer. Yeah. Well, works when good. when I got to uh, Masan, yeah. uh, so I had three months in training, and I generally loathed Korean food, and I'd begun to lose weight. Mm -hmm. When I got to Masan. Um, uh, I was no longer. We were no longer living in hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were. We were told to go and find a boarding house. So the professor who was was my uh, chido kyosu, um, my my guiding professor, mm -hmm. um, 
he took me around to uh, a boarding house, and uh, the landlady uh, provided uh, breakfast and dinner, and she did my wash, not uh, dry cleaning, just uh, clothes washing. Oh, wow. Uh, and the one-month charge for a single room in her boarding house mm. was 10,000 won. That was the equivalent of 25 U.S. dollars. Was that a lot back then? Was that reasonable? Were you happy? That was, that was really inexpensive. Okay. But the thing was, her um, breakfast was a, a small piece of fried fish um, and then, of course, some kimchi and some, some a bowl of rice mm. and um, a little uh, soup, either um, the radish soup, the muguk, or mm. um, a little uh, denjang jjigae, maybe. Um, and it was exactly the same um, meal for the dinner. <laughs> and so day after day, yeah, yeah. it was precisely, it was no variation whatever. Yeah. Um, so I began to, to Did lose Did she some, eat that like as well? Did she eat the same thing? Do you know? I or? don't know. Okay. Don't know. okay. Um, but um, it was very inexpensive. Uh -huh. But um, after two months, um, I... I wasn't too enamored of this particular boarding house, so I asked my Chidu Kyosu to find a new one, and mm. uh, he agreed. So we went on the hunt, and we found one where the Ajima said that she would provide some variety of panchan, <laughs> uh, the side dishes, um, and uh, that they wouldn't be the same uh, breakfast uh, and dinner. Uh, we had lunch at the at the university, yeah. so uh, that wasn't a problem. But um, but I I finally got very hungry, and I began to uh, almost it was an epiphany sort of experience. I then began to really crave Korean food. I I had this I, perhaps because of the vitamin C factor. I'm not sure, mm. but you know there wasn't any orange juice or anything. I mean, literally, breakfast was. A small piece of fried fish, mm. a um, not a whole fish, just uh, just a, a chunk mm. of uh, fried fish, uh, perhaps um, uh, some um, uh, some uh, fried uh, tubu bean curd. Um, was there coffee? Uh, no, 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 no. Green no, tea? Uh, no, no. Boricha? There, no, uh, there was some porticha. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so there was barley water, but. Oh. Um, so there were a, maybe a couple of uh, vegetable dishes, uh, and there would be a soup, um, and uh, and and that was it. So it was very simple um, breakfast and very simple dinner. Um, but somehow I, I suddenly clicked with the kimchi, and it really began to taste uh, extremely good. And um, then it was like. Um, someone turning on a light switch. I went from not liking Korean food to adoring it mm -hmm. and looking forward to it mm, um, yeah, me with too keen now. anticipation. Yes, uh, because the the second landlady uh, at her boarding house, the uh, boarders ate well mm. uh, because she was something of a um, of a chef and. She she liked to uh, to do things that were really quite quite pleasant. Um, um, How many sauces men or bo boys in the boarding house? So well, that, I mean, they did only one sex, uh, so oh, okay. it was yeah. uh, she only catered to men. There would have been other boarding houses where they took only where the landlady took only women boarders. But, yeah, but ours was only men, and that was the standard way. Yeah. Um, it, it avoided, I think, complications. So it's almost like a dormitory and, and one lady yeah, run, runs yeah. all the things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think she, she had five or six of us. Um, and, um, and of course, I was the only the only foreigner. And, and remember, there were very, very few foreigners that were identifiably foreign because – a lot of the Japanese managers who may have been walking around in the streets of Masan uh, when they were off duty from their uh, jobs down in the free export zone, um, 
you know, despite what people say about Japanese looking Japanese, they don't always. No. And, uh, you, you can't always tell a, a Japanese or a Korean or a Chinese apart. Um, but they could tell you apart. Well, they could certainly <laughs> see that um, they, they were dealing with what they assumed uh, correctly, in my case, was yeah. a, a Yank. Yeah. And uh, that was the term for uh, all foreigners. It was just miguk sodom. It wasn't wegukin. Mm. It wasn't the correct uh, term for foreigner. It was the term for American. That, that was the term they applied to all foreigners. I sometimes wondered if it annoyed the uh, English uh, missionary uh, who uh, lived in the outskirts of Masan with his family. Mm. He was a Protestant missionary, and I don't know which denomination, but most likely Presbyterian or um, Methodist. And um, he um, would see him occasionally in, in town and uh, exchange a few words with him, but... Um, the only others I would see would be the occasional uh, Roman Catholic missionary priest, mm -hmm. um, and um, so yeah, there were hardly any any foreign. There was no uh, U.S. military installation nearby Mossan um, in the nineteen by the nineteen seventies. They had withdrawn whatever they may have had. Um, uh, during and after the Korean War. Do you have any photos from back at that time? I don't. Um, the, I do have a few um, photos of uh, uh, taken by some friends, um, but I don't know where they are. Yeah, um, it's, it happened. Uh, can, can you tell me what the people were like? Because they, they might say that Hard times make strong people and good times make... I'm just wondering about... You've seen Korean people over 50 years. You've seen the, the rise from cheap and cheerful to luxury and affluence that we have today. Yeah. Well, it wasn't always cheerful. I mean, it was cheap, but uh, <laughs> the, the, a lot of Koreans were uh, undergoing a lot of pressure. Um, they, they wanted to make mm. good in life. Mm. And you could encounter some Koreans who were seriously depressed because they didn't see a way to make their lives much better in Korea. And they mm. they really, really wanted to emigrate to America mm. uh, or to someplace outside Korea because getting a U.S. visa was, uh, was problematic. The, the Americans had a, um, a visa limit per country. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of GIs had been, you know, marrying Koreans uh, for years after the Korean War. And so those women who married uh, American soldiers then could invite their family members to Korea. So the, the visas uh, that were allocated got, got taken up year after year. Mm. Um, and they, there was a high demand for them. And the, the Koreans took a while before it uh, dawned on them that, uh, well, maybe trying somewhere uh, like Canada mm -hmm. where you could have a, 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 a – and in fact, if you wanted to, you, you know, you could become Canadian and then you could go down and live in the U.S. and you could even become American uh, that way. So there were various avenues of approach. And of course, eventually they did cotton on that, uh, that the USA wasn't the only way out of Korea if you were desperate to get out. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very hard, I think, to imagine what it was like um, in, in those days because today people do live so so well generally in Korea uh, in any place and particularly in Seoul. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, but in those days, it wasn't the case. Um, you could, you'd find people that were uh, – possibly they had enough to eat, but they didn't have uh, – a great deal, um, and they were living in tar paper, uh, plywood shacks, and it was just pretty grim. Um, grim uh, is the right word, I think. And so you could understand why those people were uh, very, very eager to mm. get out mm. and to make something uh, of their lives because the Korean factory work didn't pay very much in those days. So. 
if you were not a university graduate, uh, but you had a skill like an auto mechanic or um, and it later on, uh, after I returned to the U.S. in the mid-70s following my Peace Corps service, I ran across uh, Koreans in uh, the suburbs of Baltimore who were um, like auto mechanics mm -hmm. and auto body workers and uh, also, interestingly, jewelry um, craftsmen. Mm -hmm. They were diamond cutters. Mm -hmm. So they'd uh, developed a specialty skills, um, and they they worked with uh, American and and European uh, jewelers, um, uh, and and so yeah, people like that just didn't want to stay in Korea because they didn't think they'd be compensated very well, and in the social. Um, uh, strata at the time, uh, people who worked with their hands weren't uh, regarded as uh, in the top tier of society. Mm. Probably that's still true, but but it's a bit different because uh, a factory worker in Korea today can can easily afford to buy a car. And I, I remember one of my English department students saying that. Um, wouldn't it be uh, terrific if if he could uh, get a job as a teacher, uh, high school teacher, and then uh, eventually buy a car? Buy a car. That was a because it, there was hardly anybody that could buy a car. The only people who had cars mm. were considered wealthy. There was a couple of professors, not in the English department, but in some of the other departments at mm. the university, who had cars. But they didn't know how to drive. They just happened to have <laughs> money. Yeah. Their families had money. And so they had enough money to buy a car. And if you had enough money to buy a car, you probably had more than enough money to hire a full-time driver, a chauffeur. Mm. And that's what they did. Mm. So they had um, – and, of course, some of the bankers had uh, uh, cars assigned to them by the – and drivers. They didn't drive themselves. Um, and so the the, uh, the drivers, um, you know, had a skill, but it wasn't well compensated. Mm. The taxi drivers always seemed to be because um, they they didn't have any waiting time on their meters in those days. It was all distance based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in 1972, the flag fall was, I believe, it was 50 won. Right. For the first two kilometers, and then it rose at ten won per whatever segment of distance when mm. it was after that. And I think that was the sole cab rate. Cabs in in provincial places like Pusan and and Masan, flagfall might have been thirty won. Mm. Can't remember. It Fascinating to me, Hank. Remember when you said about we we've talked about the 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 grimness and the, the the poverty and the cheapness. Remember when you said that you were flying in that you saw flat guns and yeah, uh, keep the curtains closed. Was there any element of that in society? Because you get the Yushin, nineteen seventy five is a little bit later. But was there any element of I'm living in no, the cold. No, Yushin was 72. Oh, Yushin was 72. Yeah, she, Yushin happened in October 72, of, of just about three, uh, four weeks before we arrived. I must be thinking um, of something else. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. anyway, um, yeah, there was um, uh, a lot of government uh, propaganda all over the place uh -huh. in, in big uh, posters uh, and um, – on the sides of, of walls, it would say, you know, Susang Amen Tashipoko, Wishim Amen Shingo Haja. So let's, uh, if it's suspicious, um, mm. you know, look again, and if it seems suspicious, report it. Um, or, uh, you know, Miao Kong, uh, crush communism. Mm. Um, so these, or, or um, uh, these signs and banners would be all over cities and towns, mm. just everywhere you looked. You'd see one of these uh, exhortations to be on your guard. Mm. Um, did it feel like that walking um, through the city or was it just well, they were just no, the posters? No, it did, 
It did feel um, it, it wasn't too oppressive to walk around. You, mm. you didn't have an MP with a, a carbine on every street corner, mm. but you did have MPs manning roadblocks mm. uh, periodically, um, usually on the perimeter of towns and cities as buses would uh, roll out of or into a town or a city. The Korean army MPs would set up uh, a roadblock and they would get on the, uh, the, the bus and they would salute the um, assembled um, riders mm. and then they would go down the rows and they would look at everybody's ID card and mm. they were generally looking for deserters, not spies. Okay. So they were looking for guys who decided that the army life wasn't for them and they'd like to duck out and... Mm. Um, uh, so apparently that happened at times. Um, of course, there may have been uh, some uh, spies ar around. I, I think it couldn't have been that difficult for uh, North Koreans were um, uh, sometimes uh, coming uh, south in small craft and getting close enough to the shoreline to have people swim ashore. Mm. And that's why you were only allowed to to swim on the coasts either west or east in designated um, uh, beach areas mm. that were open to the public. Otherwise, everything was closed off and uh, was theoretically guarded by the Korean South Korean military. Um, but even so, I mean, the coastline is just too vast to protect completely. Was there a big fear of North Korea? Now we, we know and see about it all the time. It's on the news. We know ambassadors who live and work there and people that report on it and write essays. And But at that time, I guess it was a little bit more enigmatic. It was a little bit more unknown, perhaps, or, or was that not the case? Or? I don't think that was the case at okay. all. I think uh, North Korea was a, a very uh, real and tangible threat to many a South Korean who remembered, because uh, remember, if you were in your 30s, mm -hmm. you were a child during the war, mm -hmm. and you may have seen some pretty horrific stuff. Um, and uh, the Korean... Um, film industry was churning out uh, film after film of, you know, how the glorious South Korean army had, uh, uh, you know, saved this village or that village from the, uh, the, the horrific depredations of the uh, North Korean people's army and mm. their, uh, their, their wild and um, uh, horrific uh, killings of civilians and so all these things were depicted in, in films of the, that era. Mm. And, um, yeah, so people were being bombarded with anti-communist uh, uh, messages uh, in, in public places, but also on radio, on TV, and in the theaters and in the films. Um, so there was a and, – and, of course – in those days, the Soviet Union was a very much going concern, mm. um, and Red China was the Red China of Mao mm. and uh, of the Cultural Revolution. There wasn't any any charitable impulses that could be detected from either. Um, you know, Khrushchev, when he visited America, was uh, uh, as, when he was Soviet leader at the time took his shoe off in the UN and banged it on the table and mm. said that he would um, annihilate the West. Bury you as well or something, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, that was his language. phrase, I think. Yeah. The actual, yeah. we will bury you. Yeah. We will bury you. So, um, and you people, decided to go to South well, Korea amidst all well, this. Well, people felt threatened, yeah. Um, yeah. but you felt threatened uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm. I remember as a child... Um, during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, living in the suburbs of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with my fellow students uh, practicing diving under our desks in case the Soviet missiles landed um, on or near D.C. That was supposed to save us, mm. being, um, you know, having your your hands over your, your head and then being... Um, in a in a squatting position under your school desk was supposed to save you. 
from a uh, from, from an from atomic a, weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, no, we we knew that the um, North Koreans meant business. Um, they had not sworn off the idea of. Um, uh, of of taking the South uh, by force, and from time to time they pulled off raids, like the famous one being the 1968 one, when there were Peace Corps volunteers mm. in Seoul at the time, mm. along with other uh, like U.S. Embassy staff. Um, when the shooting started, and that uh, group of North Korean commandos that uh, were trying to get to the Blue House to kill Pak Chung Hee mm. uh, were, were um, confronted uh, by Korean police and military, and uh, I think all but uh, a couple of them were killed. Um, so yeah, it was um, it, it it was uh, there were constant reminders when you when you went to see a film, uh, and that was a diversion that that um, I often went to. I uh, got to seeing a lot of the um, the, the Korean um, uh, actors who were famous at the time, like the uh, the, the very uh, beautiful uh, Yoon Chung Hee, who died um, just a short uh, time ago mm -hmm. uh, in Paris, where she'd spent the last 30 years of her life. And uh, there was... Uh, a well-known uh, Korean actor named Pak No Shik, who played tough guy roles, um, gangster type mm. roles, um, and then of course they were showing the, uh, the 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 kung fu films and spaghetti westerns uh, and uh, films from yesteryear uh, like Gone with the Wind. Mm. The Ten Commandments. Uh, they still show that on television these yeah, days. <laughs> I don't even, know if you've noticed. Even today, yeah. W was but, there a Korean movie uh, of the time that you that you were drawn to, or that you remember well, as being? I remember one um, about the assassination of Kim Gu. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. I thought because they they clearly wanted to, make, and this is part of the whole Pak Chung Hee era thing that. Um, you know, having Pac uh, come in meant that they didn't have to uh, do a um, hagiography of uh, Syngman Rhee. Mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. could they could look at him, uh, you know, through a uh, a dark lens. <clears throat> and um, while there was still great respect uh, for, you know, he just stayed around too long and. Uh, there was too much corruption uh, in his regime, and so the murders as well. I believe they were getting. Well, I mean, there there were certainly some political um, some political ret retribution that yeah. took place, and the the suggestion in this film was that not that Syngman Rhee was identified as ordering Lieutenant Shin, I think it was he was who pulled the trigger to go out there and and you know, kill Kim Gu. Mm. Mm -hmm. But the suggestion was that, uh, you know, th that the government of the day, uh, which was Syngman Rhee's, was not unopposed mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, th this uh, action by Shin. And the whole episode is, is, is a fascinating one because, of course, um, he was arrested but spent very little time in in jail and was actually freed uh, about the time the Korean War broke out, mm. uh, and uh, you know so it um, it was never actually investigated, and there was never I think a um, a genuine prosecution of the assassin. Mm. So it was uh, it was a very interesting um, time, and the film. Um, tried to portray Kim Gu in a very positive light as somebody who who meant well mm. um, and uh, who was let down by the communists in the north mm -hmm. um, but also by people in this country mm. um, so yeah they uh, they uh, added to the luster of Kim Gu in a way that um, 
that I, I think um, was probably meant to enhance Park Chung-hee's prestige because he was showing the people that, ah, uh, you see, uh, we shouldn't think of just Sing Man Rhee as, as our sole hero of the uh, opposition era to the Japanese, mm -hmm. but we had Kim Gu as well. And There were stories about Kim Gu killing a Japanese person with a sword. I'm not sure if these stories are true, but they're well, often repeated. I think I he was not... Uh, I think the Japanese had a nickname for him, and it was something like the assassin. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, Kim Gu was not uh, reluctant to to use violence mm, when mm. it suited him. Mm. And I, th I think that's a bit problematic because uh, in some of the cases where uh, they were carrying out uh, anti-Japanese actions like the bombing in Shanghai in the uh, 1930s that uh, – that uh, killed some senior Japanese officers and officials uh, and wounded a goodly number. Um, you, you have to ask what uh, what actual point was there to doing things like that? Mm. I mean, um, it you know it wasn't going to overthrow uh, the Japanese rule in in Korea. Um, so these occasional strikes against the Japanese were just meant to um, remind the Japanese that there were Koreans who didn't um, agree to the occupation. Yeah. And I guess that's um, that's why uh, Kim Gu is considered a, a hero, because he was willing to use violence, whereas Sing Man Rhee went to the U.S. and carried out uh, peaceful protest there. Um, they have Uisa and Yolsas and you have the Anjong guns and the, you, you do. Uh, I mean, and they spring up. It seems um, as as people do more research and decide that oh well, yeah, there was a, a guy who was uh, trying to shoot a Japanese policeman over in this park, so we should set up a little mm. little memorial plaque to him. Can, yes, can I ask you about Park Chung Yi because. Oh, yeah. he, with hindsight, there's a lot written and said about him. He, he's a figure that you cannot tell the story of South Korea without mentioning. He's, well, no. People love him and hate him in equal measure. There is also those that mm. respect him. I'm just curious, when you were here, what the image of him was or what your take on him was? Well, we were made uh, aware very early in our time that... Um, you know, we weren't here to make judgments about Korean politics. We were here to 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 expand the friendship between Americans and Koreans yeah. in a non-political way, yeah. uh, which is always the mission of the U.S. Peace Corps everywhere in the world, uh, not to interfere in local politics, but to build uh, people-to-people -people relationships. The clue's in the name, I guess, isn't it? The, yes, the, well. <laughs> the Peace Corps. Um, yeah, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Um, but um, it it was made obvious to us that you know we we weren't supposed to um, uh, to engage in anything political whatsoever, um, and it was very clear that Park Chung Hee didn't tolerate uh, protest. So mm -hmm. there weren't student protests to speak of. Uh, Occurring on a regular basis, as happened later in the 1980s under uh, Chun Doo Won, mm. um, and uh, and and uh, you know, Park was uh, a presence. Um, he was everywhere. Mm. Uh, when you went to see a film, you, before the film started, uh, you had a newsreel, mm. and in every single newsreel. President Park was uh, cutting the ribbon on this new train station or that new factory, um, and uh, you know Mrs. Park, uh, Yukiosa was was photographed uh, uh, opening up a new hospital in some mm. uh, provincial city, and uh, so they were they were very much in the forefront of uh, of the news they were on the front page of every korean newspaper and uh, 
uh, they were in the newsreels day in day out. Um, was it a presidential image at that time? Oh, was it a very much. rather than a sort of military? Because he always looked oh, very. No, well, I mean he was straight up and down, but yeah. uh, always in civilian dress. Okay. Never, never pictured in in military uniform. Mm. Um, and uh, and a lot of people. Um, you know, would once they they knew that you knew mm. that it was not appropriate to talk in public. Mm. About, I mean, they would they would say things to you in uh, in a tabang, uh, you know, in a tea room or in a restaurant uh, to let you know that. Yeah, when Park Chung Hee's face came up on the TV screen, that um, might have been in the. Um, a lot, lot of um, uh, tea rooms had uh, a, a TV, mm. and, uh, you know. Um, so when his face came on, sometimes people had a reaction that they they would lean over and tell you, you know, he's a dictator. Mm. So Koreans knew what the score was, and um, they they didn't think it was right that uh, that he should be. Um, ruling by fiat um, but there wasn't a strong enough I guess uh, opposition until really the end of his life when some riots broke out including one in Masan mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, to protest um, the the way the regime was managing the country and um, and you know it was it was considered wrong that the opposition leader um, Kim Dae Jung had been forced out of the country and um, uh, kidnapped and then nearly killed if uh, and probably would have been if it hadn't been for um, the American CIA chief mm. Don Gregg intervening and telling the Koreans not to do that. Um, this was on the boat coming back yeah, over this yeah, story. Yeah. yeah, but you know they also arrested Kim Young Sam, and he spent time in uh, in jail in the 1970s as well. Uh, so yeah, the the opposition um, wasn't united. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, as Kim Young Sam was broadly representative of uh, the Kyung Sangdo, and of course uh, the Kim Dae Jung of the Chela region. Mm. Um, but um, but but Park was was determined, and I I think he would have done his best to put a lid on the demonstrations. I I, I don't know that he could have ever been ejected peacefully, uh, as long as the army was loyal to him, and I believe it was. I mm. mean, he had he had uh, carefully selected uh, the the leaders, and it was no accident. I think that. The um, the the army uh, chief who was arrested by uh, by Chun Doo Wan and No Tae Woo um, was it was accused of uh, of not acting um, against the assassin uh, against Park's assassin um, and possibly uh, colluding with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the one of the reasons cited for his arrest was his suspicion that he had possibly colluded with the assassin. Um, and that seems to be uh, a charge completely without foundation. But um, the fact that it was made uh, by Chun suggests, I think, that Chun was uh, aware that uh, Park had a, a strong base of loyal support in the army and in the country. Mm. So the officer corps uh, and and many people uh, throughout the country. Uh, now more so in the um, in the Seoul, Kyunggi, and uh, Chungcheongdo and Kyungsangdo areas than anywhere else, mm. because that's where the factories went. The factories basically were alongside the Seoul Busan expressway areas. That's where the expressway and, went, and, yeah. Uh, and a great many of them were in Kyungsangdo uh, locations uh, where they were close to rail, <coughs> excuse me, rail and um, highway transport that would get the goods to the port of Pusan. Mm. Did he 
did Park Chung Yi do well? Human rights aside and democracy, did he do well in developing the country? Did the the the, the five year plans and the, the expressway going to Busan was that? Was it necessary? Was it right? I know this is a very loaded question, yeah, well, I guess. but no, it's a fair question, and uh, I think so. But I once asked that same question to uh, a, a group of older Koreans hmm. uh, who were at least my age or older, um, who um, were um, senior uh, executives in the financial sector. Hmm. I, I asked it a somewhat different way. I, I said, who do you think was the greatest president since uh, the Japanese uh, left? Mm -hmm. And they they all agreed. Uh, and I, I thought they were going to say Pak, but mm. they all said Syngman Rhee. Oh, wow. And the reason they did that was that actually Pak built on Rhee's foundation because mm. Rhee um, expanded schooling. Mm-hmm. Mm. There were uh, a lot of Koreans who had uh, no schooling or very little schooling, uh, who attended just uh, a year or two or three in the primary school rather than six or mm -hmm. eight. Um, and um, it, it, so it, it was very important to build up not only the primary education, but also the middle school and the high school mm. education. Mm. So Re put a lot of focus on that. And he he also uh, did a lot of the civil engineering uh, rebuilding so that you, you had some roads, you had bridges that were rebuilt if they'd been destroyed during the war. Mm. Um, you you had to um, rebuild parts of the cities, particularly Seoul, which mm -hmm. had seen a lot of devastation, uh, so that you could um, you know have uh, places for people to live, mm -hmm. accommodation, and so Re was able to do a great deal on the infrastructure side, and on the um, human infrastructure side. And without that, Pak Chung Hee could not have uh, turned uh, the uh, South Korean economy into the miraculous economic uh, miracle that it was. Mm. Uh, because if the factory workers can't read the directions on the uh, machinery, they mm. can't operate it yeah. very well. Uh, so that's that's the key. Um, and that was in place not by Pak Chung Hee, but by Syngman Rhee. And uh, Pak Chung Hee built on that. And yeah, we, we found the, uh, the five year economic development plans to be somewhat amusing because um, they, um, they were reminiscent of the Soviet and the Chinese five year economic. So they were uh, somewhat similar uh, to the economic, uh, the government-directed economic development plans of the communist countries, the principal communist countries. Central planning rather than open market. Exactly. Yeah. So it did seem a bit strange, but then when you looked around and you saw what the government was actually doing, you know, when I went out to see my um, a student friend who invited me to his country village one um, spring break, it might have been, or summer break, um, mm. Uh, he invited me out to a weekend, and um, that first year, which I guess was 1973, um, there was no uh, electricity, so they were using candles wow. uh, once it became evening time, and there was no piped water. They were using well water, mm. um, and uh, the Bridges over uh, streams were very rudimentary. What was the toilet like? Strange question. Was well, it inside, uh, outside? No, out, everything was outside, outside in those days. Yeah. I mean, even in cities, uh, mm -hmm. you, you didn't normally have indoor facilities. Mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. there were outhouses throughout mm -hmm. Seoul mm -hmm. and everywhere. And you could tell when they were being cleaned out because the guys with the, uh, with the shoulder yoke had um, – 
rather odiferous buckets on either side as they came through the alleyways. You gave them a wide berth, I yeah. will tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you let them go uh, first. And, and uh, you know, it was um, – out in the countryside, it, w- it was literally a hole in the in the ground with some um, uh, with some bamboo um, to um, uh, mark the spot. Oh wow! Yeah, and of course the toilet tissue was uh, cut up pieces of newsprint. That's all they had. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I guess yeah. the question. Well, I'll just yeah. go on and finish. So that was Please. that. That was yeah. the way it was in '73. By the time mm-hmm. I got back for another visit, it was '74, mm-hmm. and uh, they'd had electricity, and uh, a number of the uh, the village um, houses had uh, tile roofs, mm-hmm. um, and so um, they also had some piped water. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there'd been um, tremendous improvement in quality of life in the space of a year, and you could you could see that it was benefiting the the people. I mean, they they really enjoyed having electric light to they could study, uh, they could read at night, mm-hmm. and it, you know, with candlelight, it's not so easy. Um, and the piped water was uh, was very useful for their farm animals as well as for themselves. So. Tangible developments yeah, that benefit yeah. the people. Concrete, that would make concrete them... development, and, and of course, the big movement, um, political movement, was the Se Mao, mm-hmm. the New Village movement of mm-hmm. uh, Park Chung Hee, and that was meant to encourage people to save, um, because the the Se Mao Kumko, the um, the credit uh, cooperative uh, of the, uh, the New Kumko, yeah. Mm. The, 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 Money storage. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, th- those were meant to uh, to fund um, uh, development projects. So that could be anything from um, a concrete um, uh, road from the village to uh, a nearby town, mm. um, or a um, a new um, bridge over a stream. Mm. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it made a big difference because when you traveled in the countryside, you became covered with dust. Mm. As soon as you left the cities, uh, the, the, the metaled roads ended. Mm-hmm. There, were, there was no um, paving uh, out in the country. And uh, so whether you were in a bus or a, a car, whenever the vehicle stopped, and the dust cloud behind you came and covered the the vehicle, and you got extremely dusty. Do people wait to get out? Like the dust cloud passes, yeah. and you just dealt with it. Yeah, you just dealt with it. it, mm. it not not much point. You're going to be covered with dust whether you waited for it to settle or or not. You you know there was even if you had all the windows closed, if it was winter time, it, it still seeped in. Did you get the? It's not um, fine dust that we have today, but the, I've forgotten the name. The Hongsa. Yeah, thank you. That comes down from the Gobi, the yellow perhaps. Dust, yeah, yeah. yeah that that's thing? that's been a feature for thousands of years. It's mm-hmm. just the way the prevailing winds uh, blow uh, in the, the often in the late uh, spring. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you a minute ago, and it, it's a ridiculously open-ended question, hmm. or a hard question, but how did Korea? do it? How did Korea get rich? You said in a recent talk that I saw that back in 72, you would never believe that individual Korean investors today would have hundreds of billions of dollars in investments, that we would see the city that we do. Obviously, there's not a single clear, but if you had to give a 101 to how Korea went from no electricity and outhouses and scrambling for some beef to what we have today was it what what happened it was a miracle how <laughs> 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 yes, you been paying attention the korean miracle yeah. it was truly miraculous <laughs> well uh, the wisdom. It, it was a, a fortunate congruence of circumstances actually you you had that base of education that singman ri had uh, expanded and uh, that pak chang hee continued to expand mm. So you you had more and more people being turned out uh, with qualifications for civil engineering, mechanical mm. engineering, electrical engineering, uh, 
and and uh, for the uh, other sciences as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you need people with the uh, qualified backgrounds in, in order to do so many of these industrial processes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so because Korea was in the developing country category, it qualified for special treatment from the Americans um, and, uh, and, and to some extent from the Europeans too, but primarily the Americans really, um, who welcomed Korean um, imports uh, without any obligation on the part of the Koreans to open their market to imports. Mm -hmm. So the, the Americans welcomed uh, exports from Korea uh, and imported uh, initially a lot of the textile products that the Koreans produced in mm -hmm. the 1970s. I remember when, when I left the U.S. in 72, um, it, uh, it was rare to come across a uh, – uh, department store shirt that had a tag on it that said made in Korea. But by the time I got back, uh, you know, going into um, a department store anywhere in the U.S. In the, uh, the, from 1975 on, uh, you, you could see uh, the name brand shirts, like mm. the big um, uh, tailored shirt brand in America – and I think it's still around, is called Arrow, mm -hmm. Arrow Shirts. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you looked at the label, it said Made in Korea. Now, today, it's still not going to say Made in America because it's going to say <laughs> Made in Bangladesh or Made in India or Made in Indonesia or Vietnam or somewhere. But uh, but it was remarkable that suddenly um, the U.S. that had had its uh, historic textile industry in New England and in the southern American states – uh, was was suddenly um, verging on having that uh, industrial sector in the U.S. hollowed out by by Korean uh, uh, exports to the U.S. Wow! Uh, so that that's how they they did it. They did it by uh, producing things that other people uh, said uh, either they couldn't do. Mm. Uh, like steel, uh, you know, they were told that was too. The World Bank and Asia Development Bank didn't want them to do it, and but Park Chung Hee insisted on going ahead and starting Poong Steel um, because he didn't want to import steel from uh, Japan and from the U.S. to build basic structures. Um, he he thought that you know basic. Uh, uh, construction use quality steel could be something that Korea would benefit from having. And before very long, he also had the ambition of launching a shipbuilding industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the British and the Americans were Johnny on the spot to tell the Koreans that, look, this is 1974, it's 1975, and, and the global shipbuilding sector is just chock full of lots of shipyards that, that uh, there's excess capacity in mm -hmm. the industry. If you build new shipyards, you, you're just not going to be successful. But of course, the Koreans said, uh, well, we're going to do it. Um, and they did it. And again, there weren't any union um, labor strikes mm -hmm. tolerated by Park Chung-hee. So if you got a job as a welder in a Korean shipyard, mm. you were going to do your assigned work and uh, riveters and what have you. So they uh, produced ships to um, – and of course they were initially the simple container ships and simple bulk carriers. They didn't do anything sophisticated initially, but mm. – um, <clears throat> They produced ships on time, whereas a British or American commercial shipyard might promise uh, a ship would be ready for the ship owner in two and a half years, but then, you know, there'd be the three month, the six month, the eight month, nine month delay, mm -hmm. and that costs the ship owner money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Koreans soon developed a reputation for delivery on time. 
Mm. And from the early days, they had the, the British Lloyds inspectors and the Norwegian Detmos Veritas uh, ship classification inspectors in there in the yards to supervise the construction of these vessels to make sure that the ship owner was getting a quality product that could be insured. Mm. Because you can't insure something that doesn't have that seal of approval from the Lloyd's ship classification or the DNV mm. uh, classification. You need some, or the Americans have a ship classification society too. You need mm. some international classification society to put the seal of approval on a newly built ship so that Lloyd's of London or some other insurance company, um, some other insurance organization will provide coverage. Um, for the ship and, mm. and uh, yeah, so the Koreans um, established a reputation for uh, turning out a quality product in a timely manner. Mm. And the next thing you knew, it was the British and the American yards that were going down, not so, the Koreans. So it was textiles <laughs> first, and they, they got steel. Yeah, and well, that was the planning lines. all along. That you started with simpler industrial processes mm. that. Mm. Uh, required less sophisticated workforce. And then as your workforce uh, built uh, skill um, so that they could uh, do uh, more sophisticated uh, metal bashing uh, processes to, to, build, to build ships, to make steel, uh, to do construction. Because mm. once you had that construction steel, the logical thing was well, let's let's build roads and bridges and uh, blocks of uh, apartments. And where will we do that? Well, um, we're paying these uh, guys in the Middle East an awful lot of money for their oil. Mm. Um, we know they've got the money, um, and they they want new housing, new roads, um, new buildings. Um, we can show them that we've got the building expertise because the Korean construction companies got involved in rebuilding uh, the infrastructure in Korea after the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. also worked for the U.S. Uh, military and, and government in building facilities in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So they had a track record. By the mid-1960s, mm -hmm. the Koreans could, could point to 10, 12 years you know, since the Korean War of solid um, uh, construction um, mm. capability. And uh, the Saudis and uh, the Iraqis and uh, the Libyans and, uh, you know, on down the line, they were ready to, yeah, splash out. Let's come and build. So the Koreans earned a lot of, um, uh, of hard currency mm. uh, in their uh, construction company sector in the mid to mid uh, 70s to I'd say the mid 80s was the heyday of it really about mm. a 10 year period um, and then of course things things changed in the in the 80s but by that time the construction sector had been superseded by the automobile sector and the electronic sector so the electronics companies were Set up in the, uh, I think, uh, LG Electronics dates from the 1950s and uh, the late 50s. <clears throat> and uh, Samsung Electronics uh, kicked off, uh, I think, in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. So um, Samsung Electronics today is, of course, the giant, the, the true multinational um, electronics uh, company in Korea that f has far outpaced LG Electronics, but it started uh, out 10 years after, uh, approximately 10 years after mm. LG did. And initially they started producing radios and then black and white TVs, mm. then color. Then they got into uh, tape decks and um, VCR productions and um, and, and then, of course, PCs and um, laptops, um, and uh, in Samsung's case, uh, of course, uh, they were uh, eager to get into the chip production, semiconductors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they're, uh, they 
can say, and of course Hyundai Group had some uh, early commitment to the uh, to the semis too, and that was sponsored in part by the Korean government by Korean government research, because when when the um, what's now SK, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, of course, started out as Hynix, and that was part of that was associated with the Hyundai Group mm. in the early going, and then Samsung. Um, well, those uh, those companies were um, benefiting from also from Korean government research, and um, they knew that they were a couple of years behind uh, the chip development levels of the major Japanese semiconductor. The, DRAM memory chip producers, mm -hmm. but they kept narrowing the gap, and mm -hmm. you know, so it went from two years to a year and a half, and a year, and six months, and then suddenly they were neck and neck, and then they were <clears throat> outpacing the Japanese, it and have never looked, was, never looked back. Helps that it was the Japanese that <clears throat> they were trying to catch. There was probably some well inspiration um, there. Before yeah. we go on that, I, I really want to ask you this one question, Hank, which is that you mentioned the Johnnies on the spot. British and the Americans telling Koreans they can't, they shouldn't build these ships because the market's there. And there's this fabulous quote from, I believe his name is Ho Hua Pyong uh, from Chun Doo Wan's regime when they were getting the 88 Olympics. And he says, Korea always goes in head first. Like, when do we have any other choice? It's easy to think of South Korea as a sort of a conservative country in that but it seems to in the way you describe it in the way it's well let's build ships and let's do this there's an attitude isn't there in there somewhere uh, alongside the expertise the education well, yeah. the development there's yeah. this Hamian Hamian Dwe Hamian Dwe Hamian Hamian Dwe you translate as it can be done or do it yeah. and it happen yeah do it and and it'll work <laughs> yeah um, so I think the other thing that the Koreans did benefit from was the association with Japan. Mm -hmm. They had before them the model of a country that um, had been devastated in war mm -hmm. and then uh, rebuilt its uh, industrial base uh, with a view to providing quality product. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, it was increasingly successful in doing that. You know, the, the first iterations of of Japanese uh, Toyotas uh, failed in, in the U.S. Uh, market in the early 50s. They, okay. weren't, they weren't sturdy enough. But they learned from that, and then they improved. And, and, and sure enough, uh, they came back with, um, with really solid, terrific product. So the Koreans are watching this. Mm -hmm. And people like uh, Chung Ju Young of uh, Hyundai Group is telling his younger brother Chung Se Young, who was the one who launched uh, Hyundai Motors in '67 and ran it for the next 20 years, mm -hmm. um, and until um, Chung Ju Young uh, displaced him with um, with his son, who um, has recently retired as chairman and now his grandson runs mm -hmm. it, but. But yeah, initially it was run by Chung Ju Young's brother, and of course they were all Japanese speakers, and um, they um, uh, made some contacts with uh, the Mitsubishi Group, and uh, next thing you knew, they wound up getting Mitsubishi to work with them on um, on product design. So that they would begin building uh, Mitsubishi type cars. Mm -hmm. um, the initial iterations of uh, the Hyundai Pony were just the same as you would have found in Japan, I think. And they had uh, the Mitsubishi built engines. Mm -hmm. um, and subsequently, those engines were were crafted in Korea, but um, initially it was just a uh, a bunch of Japanese parts, including the engines that were assembled into the cars in Korea. But um, <clears throat> it was what Korea needed at the time. The The Pony 1 and the Pony 2 were all mechanical operation. There was no electronics, manual carburation, the whole thing. I mean, it was it, there was no solid-state electronic systems in mm -hmm. those cars. Mm -hmm. um, 
they were very straightforward and they drove like um, like jeeps. They were they were really tough. Mm. And if something broke on them, it was dirt cheap to fix. Uh, and any Korean mechanic in the entire country could uh, could do the job. Oh, wow. So um, so they they started out with um, a a base of expertise that they acquired from from the Japanese, and uh, there were some European um, companies that got involved too, um, at at various stages, uh, including from the UK. Mm-hmm. So there were some UK auto execs who um, worked with the Koreans uh, for a period. Um, when the Koreans were good at adapting and adopting um, the um, <coughs> the technologies that they were able to get hold of, and then expand on that, and so they they always had in mind uh, exporting hmm. from the early early days because they they didn't think that. Uh, in the early period in the 70s that very many Koreans could afford to buy the cars. So it made sense to try and produce them to to distribute overseas. And then as your production lines got uh, got, got bigger and your production runs got bigger, mm. the unit costs uh, declined. And then they thought, well, then eventually the Koreans will be able to, to buy them. And that began to happen in the mid-80s in mm. a serious way. I mean, in... Um, in '83, I could drive. I uh, after work, I would do some um, lecturing uh, for Central Texas College, which is contracted by the U.S. forces, like the University of Maryland, to provide off-duty <clears throat> college education to uh, GIs. Mm-hmm. So I had some of those courses that I was teaching um, at night. Um, what were you teaching? I was teaching uh, the uh, initial business course. And I also taught English uh, composition, mm-hmm. and I could get up from um, Central Seoul to either Weijangbu or Tongducheon mm. in uh, no more than an hour. Oh wow! It'd probably take double that time to get to Tongducheon today, and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, well over an hour to get to. But Weijang uh, Weijangbu was uh, like. Uh, 30, 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. It was easy. Mm-hmm. Um, relatively few cars, and in your way in 1983, you could you could get up some speed. But um, 83, 84, those were salad days for traveling around Korea, um, anywhere you went, and the roadways in the countryside had been paved, mm. so the driving was a lot easier, a lot more comfortable. Um, you could find comfortable um, the hotels, and, and um, like if you went to Songnisan, they had that rather pleasant um, hotel there. And um, so, getting around became uh, easy, and that that was a factor in people wanting to buy cars because they they knew it was it was increasingly possible to travel all over the country in mm. relative ease. Mm. Um, and um, they began to produce somewhat larger models, uh, like the Stellar mm-hmm. uh, came out as a successor to the um, to the Pony series, uh, and um, that was a, a mid-sized model. And then they had, of course, the Grandeur. <clears throat> they got that design. Hyundai got that design from direct from Mitsubishi. Mm-hmm. That's still around today, isn't it? The Grandeur? It's still a brand. I, I still see why oh, the name is familiar to me. I don't know if they use that brand overseas, but they okay. do use it in Korea. Yeah. 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 Still a brand. Um, so you you had um, from about 1986 <clears throat> the bizarre experience of a lot of adult Koreans mm. learning to drive. Now, I learned to drive when I was 15 years old. Yeah. Because yeah. that was the legal. Uh, uh, learner driving age <laughs> in the state of Virginia. Mm-hmm. 
And um, many an American learns at 16 or 17 yep. to drive. And, um, yeah, it was um, – uh, so it it was a bizarre thing because <clears throat> here are these <clears throat> these Koreans who are in their 30s and 40s getting behind the wheel and you know trying to make a go of it so you know they they'd be in a three lane highway on the <clears throat> rightmost lane and decided yeah. that they needed to be in the leftmost lane and they just <laughs> do an almost lateral dash across um the the uh, middle lane and the... but it's okay because they put their indicator on before they did it. Well, yeah, maybe they, they did, maybe they didn't. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what they do now, but that wasn't always the case. Um, so yeah, there were quite a lot of accidents. Yeah. Um, and at one time, uh, for uh, the number of cars, Korea had the I think the highest death rate in the world. Oh. They, they had over. Over 10,000 uh, road deaths a year because, of course, the pedestrians were were not used to um, worrying about cars either. Mm. And so they'd often walk with their backs to the flow of traffic, mm -mm. <clears throat> which in Western countries, as children, were generally taught not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, the... Um, <clears throat> The advent of the adult driver was quite an experience in the mid to late uh, 80s in the run-up to the Olympics. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, uh, by that time, the, uh, the people who started driving in the 80s had had a few years of experience. And people coming on <clears throat> and learning to drive tended to be younger mm -hmm. and um, more athletic, I suppose. Yeah. Than middle-aged people generally, car natives, so to speak. Um, mm. So, um, and then the sheer number of cars uh, lowered the general speed in Korea. Uh, oh, sorry, in Seoul in particular. Mm. Um, so that that caused a collapse of the uh, uh, of the numbers being killed and injured on the highways. Uh, Took you longer to get to Weijongbu then? Yeah. But it was probably a safer trip. Yeah. Can I ask you during all this, because we're coming up to sort of the 90s and the IMF, and I do want to ask you about that, but you've mentioned Hyundai, you've mentioned uh, SK and Samsung <laughs> and these family-run conglomerates. Yeah. Because you spoke earlier about the five-year <laughs> plans being perhaps similar to Chinese or Soviet state-centered economic yeah. plans. Yeah. Family-run conglomerates are not something you find in many other places around the world. Well... Are they, or, are, well or are they? No, please. I mean, yeah, go on. You, you can find some... Um, uh, I mean, the uh, the farm equipment uh, maker in the UK, I think they're called JCB or something like that. It's a family mm -hmm. business. Okay. The, um, the, the Twinnings um, uh, Tea is a family business. Um, it's just that... Point well taken. It's just that the the scale of some of the business. I guess the biggest one in the Western world might be the, um, the Ford Motor, mm -hmm. which is no longer actually run by the Ford family, but they still have, I think, the most significant shareholding. Mm -hmm. And if a Ford family member um, wanted to be chairman, that would probably happen. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but yeah, the. Um, Korean chaebols are basically <clears throat> the old uh, Japanese zaibatsu mm. system resurrected. Mm. Um, the, um, the 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 uh, zaibatsu um, were the Japanese industrial structure of uh, pre World War II and through World War II, and were broken up by um, uh, the occupation under MacArthur to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, what they did was they they allowed the companies to continue existing, but they forced out the family owners. Mm -hmm. So they basically confiscated the shares and told the Japanese family owners to take a hike. <clears throat> but um, you know, the Koreans are watching 
this process, and they were thinking, well, would we want to do that? I mean, we don't want the government to run all companies because we're not communists. Mm -hmm. And we don't think that's going to result in a good outcome if the government's going to do everything. Mm -hmm. Then probably there will be a lot of things it won't do terribly well. Might be better if we had a uh, cadre of uh, business people that we could uh, assign various sectors to them and we could fund their operations because we will see that bank loans go only to manufacturing companies. Mm. They, they won't go to a service establishment like a hotel. It wasn't legal to get a bank loan to build a hotel. Couldn't do it before 1998. Can I just ask something? So the Chebel was almost like a conscious decision rather than a natural evolution. There was a – I'm not sure if that's what you're well, hinting no, at. Well, no, not exactly. I mean there was some natural evolution. The Chebel have often tried to portray themselves as having antecedents that go back to post-World War II. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in, in fact, the most successful of all of them by, by far is Samsung Group and um, – the founder of Samsung Group, Yi Byung Chol, was uh, was delighted that he was uh, able to become a successful entrepreneur under the Japanese. Mm, mm. Yeah, he wasn't ashamed of it. Mm. Um, he felt that what he was doing was good for Korean people, mm. and so he was proud of uh, having been successful during the Japanese era. So many of the others, it seems to me, have tried to to finesse and fudge it a bit. I mean the. Is, so many of the others date their um, advent to the late 40s, for example. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that, you know, okay, so where did they get the money to launch in the late 40s? Well, hang on. Uh, when did the Japanese live? leave? In the mid-40s. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, the money didn't, didn't just suddenly happen by accident. They must have been doing something in the Japanese era that was... Uh, remunerative and rewarding and it produced enough capital so that they were able to launch these companies uh, after the Japanese left. Um, so, yeah, some of the chable that, that claim that their histories go back to the late 40s, I think, yeah, well, maybe yes, maybe no. But they... Yeah, they, they were reliant on the family. And remember Chung Ju Young of, um, uh, of um, Hyundai, mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was one of about a half a dozen brothers. Right. Um, so, I mean, they all pitched in um, to do various uh, things. Um, construction, uh, of course, was the, the premier initial thing and and then they uh, <coughs> then they got into um, uh, automobiles and steel and um, <coughs> and a variety of other things um, my economics professor always uh, said too big to fail when he was describing the chebo that they were and some people sort of uh, jokingly refer to the country as the Republic of Samsung. They're, they are, for, for those I guess that don't know, we know it well, but you can wake up in a Samsung apartment and check your Samsung phone and then watch the Samsung baseball team and check your Samsung insurance and it's, it's morning to night, you can have these. You can have life insurance, you can have your premises insured for uh, you know, the fire um, by Samsung Fire and Marine. Mm. Um, you can watch your uh, Korean um, Samsung baseball team on a Samsung TV. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's uh, there. Up and down the line. Well, this is what <clears throat> a lot of the uh, Chabel wanted to replicate. <laughs> they all wanted to be <coughs> in construction. They all wanted to be in shipbuilding. They all wanted to be in some aspect of the automobile sector. Uh, mm. um, <clears throat> and... Um, Sometimes it was possible, and sometimes it didn't work out terribly well. Uh, and um, so there, there were a number of chebols that collapsed in the what the Koreans called the IMF crisis, which 
is the term they preferred rather than the Korea crisis. Yeah, yeah. 90, 97, 98, um, the general Asia financial crisis, but in Korea it was a general business collapse. Um, mm. Because the Chaebol, in some cases, had overextended. I think the first one that went down was Hanbo Steel that had committed to an incredibly expensive mm -hmm. new style of um, <clears throat> steel production that was just too experimental and too costly. And so they went down. And <clears throat> then right, left, and center, <clears throat> some of the others, including Kia Motors, mm -hmm. um, went down as well. Uh, and there was a helping hand to rescue some of them. Um, the IMF actually wanted what is now the, the SK uh, Hynix uh, to be sold to a European semiconductor banker. But the Koreans dug in, the Korean government people had poured a lot of government money into the semiconductor uh, research and development. And they didn't want <coughs> Korean semiconductor producers going into foreign ownership. <coughs> now, with Samsung, it was okay because mm. Samsung was the leader of the pack. But uh, Hynix had stumbled, and the Hyundai Group wasn't in any position to support it. Mm. Good decision to keep it in-house, I would say, or in-country. Well, they, they did. I mean, they, they for years, it was basically a Korea Development Bank uh, operation. Mm. And eventually, of course, they found a buyer in the SK Group. Mm. Um, and this is what happened time and time again. The various tables uh, collapsed and their, their managements were uh, dismissed, but the banks kept the companies going. And um, eventually, uh, in just about every case, they found some buyer who would take it on. Mm. Um, now, in some cases, the Daewoo uh, construction was too big a, a bite for the uh, Kumho Ajiana Group to swallow. So that contributed to their difficulties. Mm. <clears throat> but in a lot of cases, uh, the the underlying companies were often reasonably sound. I mean, I think General Motors got a got a good um, uh, base in uh, buying Daewoo Motors. Uh, Daewoo had simply wildly overexpanded uh, factories at, at international uh, places that mm -hmm. it was interested in, like Romania and. Poland. I mean, their Romanian factory. I I read um, uh, had a capacity for four thousand uh, for a hundred thousand vehicles a year at the initial point, but in the initial years, it was only producing four thousand. I mean, the Romanians just didn't have the the money to buy cars in the immediate, you know, post mm. uh, Soviet collapse period, mm. <clears throat> and so there wasn't any any way for. Um, Deu Group to hold uh, its head above water once the uh, government funding dried up <clears throat> and um, the government couldn't devote all of its funding resources through Korea Development Bank <laughs> exclusively to Deu Group. So, mm. so Deu Group uh, went down for the count. But <clears throat> you know, General Motors was interested in in because uh, they had been historically a joint venture partner for Daewoo Motors, mm -hmm. uh, and they had allowed Daewoo to buy them out. But then when Daewoo Motors got into trouble, uh, Daewoo Group got into trouble, um, <clears throat> it, it was uh, seen by GM as, a, as an opportunity to come back and offer the Korean government a, uh, yeah, a, a way to unravel this um, and keep the workforce in place. Mm. And of course, it's been somewhat successful initially because they, they had a run where some of the cars produced in Korea by GM were uh, reasonably popular overseas, and so there was a lot of exporting. But then, you know, times change and models change, and I guess they needed to retool, and the Existing Daewoo Motors factories in a couple of cases were just not suitable for purpose in modern manufacturing, and so they had to downsize, and that's always extremely difficult and mm. controversial in Korea. <clears throat> uh, 
and you need the permission of a labor court judge to dismiss staff, and it can only be done by a company showing the court that uh, circumstances are dire, and uh, that was done. And so, yeah, it's been a bit of a struggle in very recent years for GM in Korea, but um, but they are um, producing new models, and perhaps they'll have more success. Mm. We've been macro for a while. One of the experiences that you will have had here, Hank, is that you've been inside offices, businesses, boardrooms, and things like this. I wonder if we can go into the working environment, into the Korean business environment, because we, we've spoken about them at large on that kind of mm -hmm. national scale. But in the day-to-day, -day when you're dealing with uh, Korean business people and businessmen and it's very easy to understand it on a abstract theoretical level of hierarchy and soil and stories yeah. of kaptil yeah. and tebol well, and <clears throat> well yeah i mean i wonder what it's like inside well uh, the the key is to be uh, inside at a um, reasonably uh, significant level uh, when i worked for in in the course of about 40 years working in, in finance, I had two stints at uh, Korean stock brokerages. Um, the first was uh, three years, and that company is now known as uh, Shinhan Securities. Mm -hmm. The second one was called Corio Securities, and it also uh, collapsed in the um, uh, IMF period, <clears throat> and it was one of... Uh, Two, two of the three Korean large Korean securities companies that collapsed were not rescued. Mm. One was, and that's today the Shinhan Securities. Mm. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, in that first uh, stint uh, at what's now Shinhan Securities, <clears throat> I was hired as a deputy general manager of the international department. So I had the Bujang. Uh, senior to me in the department, and that was it. <clears throat> and then we had a director mm. and a managing director over mm. us. But you know, it was easy for me uh, as a uh, as a chajang to uh, to see the director and uh, and the managing director, and so um, so I was able to to have a good relationship with uh, the Bujang and everybody in the uh, s senior level to me. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and um, then in my subsequent uh, time at the Korean securities company Corio that did collapse and did not find a buyer to take it out of collapse, um, <clears throat> I was a director mm. level there. <clears throat> and so... I had um, uh, more um, seniority. Um, I had uh, staff working for me, um, and uh, <clears throat> we were producing research on um, Korean listed companies in English primarily mm. and secondarily in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, we had analysts who were from... Uh, Japan, Canada, the U.S., uh, and, of course, Korea. Um, so not a big team. I guess I probably had about um, <clears throat> um, seven or eight analysts and a couple of managers, and then we had some support staff. So <clears throat> the team that I was responsible for was probably about 15 in size, so it wasn't. And I was the senior one, so I was the Issa Nim, mm. you know, the, uh, the, uh, the director, because um, <clears throat> they tend to call you by your title in Korean corporate life. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you're a deputy general manager, they call you that. If you're general manager, you're called a Bujang, Issa, director. What's it like so, to be an Isanim? Well, I enjoyed it uh, <laughs> very much. I mean, it wasn't yeah. our fault that the company collapsed. The mm. collapse was caused by uh, by uh, debt issues that they had guaranteed for Korean companies that went down in the 
IMF uh, crisis and mm. couldn't pay their debts, and the guarantees were pulled. And mm. so that drove the securities company that issued the guarantees. Uh, those companies went into bankruptcy then and uh, were dissolved in two cases. And in one case, a private equity firm came in and bought the company and eventually sold it to Shinhan Group, and that's Shinhan Securities today. Mm. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I think uh, if if you're at a, uh, a senior level, um, Korean corporate life can be really quite quite okay, uh, mm -hmm. quite quite pleasant. Um, I, I I think there's always more more pressure to um, conform in various ways when you're at a Korean company. Um, if the boss wants to have drinks with you after work, you, you might be able to make an excuse once in a while, but mm. um, <clears throat> but it's best to to turn up for drinks with the boss um, mm -hmm. uh, when the boss suggests that. And, uh, so when I've worked most of my career for British uh, securities companies and uh, asset management companies and I was uh, <clears throat> excuse me I was the senior guy in Korea in those cases reporting to people in uh, Hong Kong <clears throat> or to <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> to people in either Tokyo or Hong Kong uh, who were responsible for the region mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that enabled me to travel quite frequently over to Tokyo or, and down to Hong Kong, and then secondarily to London. Um, so I enjoyed that part of the career very, very much, um, mm. being able to travel around Asia. Um, I had a number of trips to Singapore as, as well and uh, a few other places in Southeast Asia, but um, my most regular um, routines saw me going frequently to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and London. And then uh, I'd have home leave in the U.S. Uh, my parents were still alive, so my wife and I would go to uh, to stay with them for Christmas and New Year's. <clears throat> so yeah, it was um, it was a very pleasant career because Korea was generally, although <clears throat> despite those economic infarctions like the IMF and then later the uh, 2008. Uh, global financial crisis, but aside from that, mm. um, <clears throat> most of the years were really quite quite good years, and Korea was doing extremely well economically, and most of the years when <clears throat> when I was working um, in, uh, in my career in finance. Mm. And it went from that cheap and cheerful <laughs> to, to what we have today. It must be fascinating <laughs> to see it all, because I think if you... We I used the expression car natives earlier, but if you grow up and you see the world as it is today yeah. and you don't – you've not seen the cheap and cheerful and the, the bamboo toilets and the, the newspaper, then it's easy perhaps to take it a, a little bit for granted and that's genuinely why I like to hear these stories. Perhaps as we go towards the, the, the final thing – I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask this, but Hank, but – your wife is Korean. Uh, well, she's um, <clears throat> well, she's a U.S. Know. citizen. She's a U.S. citizen. But she is Korean-born. Okay. And if you were to ask her yes. if she was Korean, I'm sure she would say, yes, I am Korean. Because I read so much about her on Facebook. Ah, well. you, have, you have the best posts about her. Well, I mean, she's <laughs> ruling the roost. So, um, <laughs> And we've been married um, uh, nearly uh, 49 years. Congratulations. Uh, so, yeah. 49. Yeah, we married during my Peace Corps time in my second year in the Peace Corps when I was about uh, eight months from the end of my Peace Corps term. Um, we married in Seoul at the uh, Franciscan uh, church over behind the British Embassy, near mm -hmm. the Canadian Embassy. Okay, just, yeah, yeah. Just, and a French-Canadian uh, missionary priest married us. Um, wow. And my wife's uh, parish priest, who is Korean, mm -hmm. showed up to assist. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was it was nice. Forty-nine years. What what's mm. the secret other than the 
Facebook posts. <laughs> well, I think it's largely been her patience and uh, <clears throat> forgiveness and yeah, um, understanding and uh, mm. yeah. Um, it's um, not something that you see routinely in any society. I think marrying a person of a different. Uh, nationality or a different race, in fact. Uh, mm. It's still rather the rare case. Um, I mean, you might <clears throat> encounter more of that in uh, the U.S. or U.K. Uh, in particular uh, mm. these days than ever before. But it's still a distinct minority yes. of people. And when we <clears throat> were married in 1974 in May, um, so just a few days to our 49th anniversary, mm. um, the marriages between the Koreans and um, uh, foreigners were very rare, and they were usually, uh, more often than not, American GIs <coughs> marrying Korean women. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and then they soon went to the USA to live. Uh, and in fact, we did the same. We lived in the USA for uh, over seven years, mm -hmm. um, from the beginning of '75 until uh, you know '82, uh, um, um, <clears throat> and um, it, it um, was a good experience for my wife because she uh, was able to get a job with a uh, American insurance company. Um, and so she could see what uh, – the first two years, we actually lived with my parents mm -hmm. in their home in the suburbs of Baltimore, Maryland. <clears throat> and my parents came to uh, really appreciate all of my wife's uh, wonderful qualities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, if I do say so, uh, immodestly. Um, but um, – yeah, we we had a fine time in the U.S. and we owned a house and uh, I had a job with the uh, U.S. Prudential Insurance and she had a job with another insurance uh, company and <clears throat> all was well. But I decided that <clears throat> it would be a good thing for the U.S. Prudential to send me back to Korea because I was watching the development of Korea throughout the the mid late seventies into the beginning of the eighties, and mm. it, it was except for the hiccup of seventy nine, mm. it was uh, a very impressive story. Mm. Uh, seventy nine, eighty, I should say. Um, uh, but you know, Korea was a, um, <clears throat> a a solid success story, and I thought that the financial sector in Korea was at a very nascent stage of development and therefore it seemed that there could probably be career opportunity there and uh, <clears throat> since I'd kept up with my Korean language because we participated in the Roman – I'm not Roman Catholic but my wife is very Roman Catholic and we participated in the Roman Catholic um, church in Baltimore every mm -hmm. week. and. We had many friends there, some of whom did not speak English. And uh, and so I was able to keep up the Korean language during our time living in the U.S. And uh, The of course friends we all... must have been amazed by you, surely. It's the well, I... American chap in Baltimore speaking Korean as you did. Well, there weren't very many <laughs> uh, in that category, yeah. No. <clears throat> um, so it was... Um, even even today, I don't think there'd be very many um, Yanks or Englishmen who uh, can uh, would be in England or in America and, and able to speak Korean reasonably well. Mm -hmm. um, why yeah. did you, uh, not? Why did you come? But this is the question. When I asked about your wife's <coughs> nationality, you said she's an American citizen, but she would clara classify herself as Korean. You've been here for so long. Is there part of you that calls this home? Is there part of you that... Oh, well, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's always going to be... Um, uh, I've lived more of my life here than I have in the U.S. Mm. Um, I uh, would always think of uh, Korea with uh, 
feeling of uh, hominess. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, but I do also recognize that it's not my country. It's it's, it's Korea, and mm. uh, it, it could never be my country. Uh, even if I became a Korean citizen, every street I walked down, the people would look over me and say, oh, there's a foreigner strolling down the mm-hmm. street. So, yeah, I've never <clears throat> um, hesitated to uh, identify myself as uh, American. Um, and Americans have not always been popular in, in Korea. Mm. There have been some <clears throat> unpleasant uh, things that have happened uh, in, in times past. Um, and that, uh, that's been awkward. But um, I think overall, the relationship that Korea has had with America has been uh, uh, very uh, beneficial uh, in both ways mm. to both yeah. no absolutely and it's uh <laughs> it's a 70 year anniversary i think of the the alliance i believe this year um mm. it, it was yeah. you hank that i think taught me or at least instructed me a while back to be less prescriptive about career in my my weekly columns and articles i'm not sure if you did it consciously or mm. unconsciously but it, it's very easy to make all these statements about what Korea could be doing, should be doing, and is doing wrong. And I suddenly felt like that in my early years. Well, I think it's a natural expat tendency. We come into Korea from our foreign framework, Mm. and we see Koreans doing things that sometimes are very different and seem quite odd to us. Mm. And we have a natural bias in thinking, oh, they're doing that in the wrong way. It would be better if they did it this way, not that way. Mm. So it's a natural process, I I think. Yeah. yeah. But I I think it's not one that comes – it's not one that goes away immediately. I think it takes a conscious effort sometimes or it needs somebody to tell you or to put it into – put the idea into your head that maybe sometimes there are other ways of doing things. It might come naturally to some people over time, but it it was – it was definitely a conscious decision and, and hearing people like you say things that sometimes you have to accept the way things are and acknowledge that this is their country and they're doing – and the success that you've laid out in this conversation today is phenomenal what they've yeah, achieved by yeah. the couple of hiccups and they know what they're doing. Well, exactly. I mean they've had great uh, <clears throat> success in a, a number of uh, sectors. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Domestic and foreign. Yeah. I mean, they've they've done a very good job at educating their their people, um, and they're um, significant in the global motor industry and the global electronics industry. Um, and uh, they have w- one of the best steel makers in the world, um, and they are uh, also very significant in the global shipbuilding sector. Mm. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, they um, they made a mark. Is there anything the world gets wrong about Korea, or is there oh. anything that people get wrong about Korea? But you know why I'm asking this? That there'd be lots of perceptions and. <laughs> yeah, I I think Korea is not terribly well known. Uh, I don't think they've been that successful in enhancing international knowledge of Korea, and I think mm. you and I probably experience that when we're uh, you know visiting. Um, the UK or the US and uh, mm. a cab driver uh, asks us where we live and we say Seoul, Korea, and they then ask, is that in the north or the south? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so the, you know, the uh, South Korea hasn't um, uh, achieved a level of recognition in the global scale that it ought to have, it seems to me. Mm. But, um but that that'll probably come in time. I mean, they're they're doing more. Um, you know, the the Netflix deal has just happened. Yeah. Uh, huh? And uh, you know, some of these um, Korean K-pop uh, and uh, the Hallyu are not just popular in Asia, but to uh, some extent in other parts of the world too. Mm. Southeast Asia and Mexico and India, it is. I see. I see the international students. <coughs> yeah, they do like it. Um, 
Hank, you are 73? I'm afraid I just turned 74. 74. My, oh, happy birthday. Uh, well, thank you. My math was, I was doing it in my head quickly based on our conversation. I wrote yeah. down the wrong number. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if we were having the interview two weeks ago, you'd, you'd be right. I'd still be 73 then. Yeah, yeah. I'm a bit slow sometimes, forgive me. What's it, this is, just as we come towards the end of this, what's it What's it like to be 74? When I set up this camera, you, you made this wonderful quip that the camera was wrong, David. And I, I looked and said, well, my camera's always wrong. I don't know how to do it. But you said, there's this old 70-year-old bloke sitting in the corner, and that surely can't be me. What's it like yeah. to be this age? Is, is it the same? You walk a bit slower now, if I can say that respectfully, as well, we walked yeah, here yeah, together. That's true. I mean, I, <clears throat> I used to... Um have a brisker pace. I, I used to run um, yeah. a lot more. I can trot a little bit now. Um, <clears throat> prefer not to do that on um, uh, on tarmac. I'd rather do it in the um, in the fields yeah. Um, yeah. where you've got natural turf and it gives your knees a little more support. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> I recognize the physical limitations. That's that's just the way it is. I think I'm grateful that, uh, in general, I <clears throat> seem to be able to do a lot of the things that I could do at uh, at age 40 and mm. 50 that <clears throat> uh, many people my age can't do. Mm. So, so mm. I've been lucky. You've had but I've tried to look after myself to a reasonable extent. You were part of the Hash House Harriers. <clears throat> yeah, that's oh, right. The, the runners. <laughs> the running club with the drinking problem or perhaps the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Um, perhaps last question, Hank. Mm. What have you learned about life? What lessons have you learned? Is there any wisdom that you can provide to young whippersnappers, such as my, myself or Mr. Salmon, as you like referring to him to sometimes? or <clears throat> any Any words or... Well, I, I don't think there's any magic uh, response to a question like that. Mm. I, <clears throat> I think one of the good qualities to have that perhaps is is not notable in a lot of uh, life in Korea is uh, patience. Mm. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Koreans tend to lay on the horn as soon as the light uh, turns green uh, uh, in about a nanosecond you'll hear the horns if you haven't begun to move in that nanosecond um, so um <clears throat> yeah i i think uh, that uh, living overseas anywhere not just korea but uh, anywhere you might be is going to call for a, a bit more patience than <clears throat> if you were in your home country um but even then, um, uh, having a, a level of patience towards people <clears throat> and events is, is probably a healthy thing, I think. I mean, it's very easy to be hypercritical of um, <clears throat> politicians, um, uh, but, um, you know, they're um, fallible and mm. they're human. And even if you like them, they're likely to make mistakes. And... Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I'd say one one key to life might be having a patient attitude. My grandmother, uh, <clears throat> Miss Florence Austin, always used to say, "Patience is a virtue." <laughs> the the rest of it is not quite politically. <clears throat> well, the... patience is a virtue. <clears throat> Possess it if you can. It's often found in a woman, but never in a man. Ooh, she would look at me that's... and say that sometimes, and we, we that's always a bit harsh. <laughs> yes, a bit harsh. <laughs> because she didn't meet you. That's why, Hank. Ah, well, that's very kind. Um, on that note, um... absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank yes. you. That was that was very interesting. It was something I enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Ukraine and so on and so on. Being more democratic and so on. Exploit us and so on and so on. Racist cliches. American dream! I do want to ask Representative Gates. American dream! Political correctness. American dream! Man, you see how woke I was? I called you out.
블레이 부처님의 가르침으로 돌아가자. 우크라이나 앤 소원 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 앤 소